Hello, and welcome to this art break from the Getty Villa Museum, the Getty's museum devoted to Greek, Roman, and Etruscan antiquities. Art break is a series uh, where we take inspiration from our collection and encourage new conversations about art and culture. I'm Bonnie Wright, manager of Villa Education here at the Getty Villa Museum. All right, so on to today's program, which is called Molten and Molded, Roman Glass and Contemporary Connections. It's inspired today, we are inspired by this cup that you see on the title slide. We'll be going into some more details about the cup, how it's made, its context and so forth. So hang on just one second. Uh, but we wanted to show that to you right off the bat. Today, I'm joined by my former colleague, Jesse Moore. Hi, Bonnie. Thanks so much for having me. Um, so Bonnie already mentioned that we used to be colleagues at the Corning Museum of Glass. Um, I am a artist and a fabricator and educator, and I now currently live in Brooklyn, New York. Um, and so I'm really excited to be here talking about this Roman mold blown glass that you see on your screen. And um, what my part in this is to do is to sort of explain to you like contemporary processes and how we use molds in everyday life as glass blowers. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about what you see on the screen. And then if we page over, uh, we're going to use um, an image, uh, we're going to use a, some of my own personal work. So the image to your left is a uh, glass, a drinking glass that I make that I use a mold for. So we'll be using this glass to sort of show you how mold blowing works. Thanks, Jesse, and welcome. On to the cup. So we're going to be exploring Roman mold blown glass today and its connection to contemporary art. And this piece, as I mentioned before, was really the inspiration. We'll be going through a few Getty collection pieces today, but this is the first of a few. It is a drinking cup. It, you'll note the dimensions on all of the slides today uh, to contextualize some of the pieces. So you'll note that they're all kind of uh, you know, small, maybe by some of today's standards. This is the other side of the cup. In the title slide, I showed you one half of the inscription that's incorporated and we're looking at the other side of the cup. Katakaire kai euphrenu, it says in Greek, which essentially translates to drink and be merry. So already you get an idea about what may have been housed in this cup. I think it was a drinking cup that maybe some wine was deposited into. And it's just so charming to me, uh, just thinking about a Roman 2000 years ago, possibly drinking from this cup in the same way that we celebrate with one another today. This piece was blown into a mold and we'll go over more about that process and its connections to today throughout the presentation. Here's a second um, example from our collection. It's a head flask, as you might imagine. It looks like a face with some hair. It is a flask with a neck and a handle. It's blue in color and it has this beautiful iridescence all over its surface. So one thing to know about iridescence whenever it appears on ancient glass is that it's entirely unintentional. The glass workers did not add that to the surface in the way that modern day glass makers are able to with chemicals and other means. So how did an ancient Roman get you know, the iridized surface? As I mentioned, it's accidental and it really only developed over maybe the millennia that it was buried, maybe in an environment that was more humid than glass likes to have surrounding it. And the result is that the surface of that glass starts to flake and the flakes catch the light, giving us this iridescence. There were so many pieces with this iridized sur these surfaces being excavated in the late 19th century, early 20th century, that glass makers like Lewis Comfort Tiffany, who you might already be aware of from stained glass windows and was also um, known for handmade blown glass, that designers were actually starting to intentionally incorporate it into the surfaces of vessels. So here's an example from the Cooper Hewitt the, uh, Smithsonian Design Museum all over the surface. Here's one final example from the Getty's collection. Again, take a look at those dimensions to help you contextualize this piece. It is a, a jug that's in the format of a cluster of grapes. So, hmm, 
Already we've discussed a little bit of a wine connection, but this piece may also have carried a teeny bit of wine, maybe a single serve sort of um, quantity, but the surface is also weathered. So you'll note that the iridized head from before was weathering on the surface. This is another example. Sometimes it can look a little cloudy or chunky or creamy on the surface. Just a few notes uh, before we get into how to make these items and how Romans may have made these items. Just wanted to express very quickly that this is a process that Roman glassmakers quickly came up with within the first hundred years of blowing glass at all because they realized that it was so quick and easy. Yeah, and I, I love this um, picture. I think it's such an excellent example um, from a maker's perspective of how efficient molds are. If you were going to make this grape flask without a mold, uh, you'd have to apply lots of little dots of glass and sculpt each one of those grapes by itself. So it would make it really um, very labor intensive to create that bunch of grapes without using a mold. And we've talked about molds uh, quite a bit since we started talking, uh, but let's page over and take a look at what we actually mean by that. So we're gonna show you an image of a contemporary mold. So this is the mold that I used to create those glasses in the first few slides. It's a three-part mold. So you can see that it has a bottom and it has two sides and those sides fit together to make sort of a contained uh, chamber that you can blow your glass into. Now this mold is made out of graphite, which is a material that we use in modern days. Um, and if we start the video, you can actually see, I'm going to place a bubble of glass into this mold and we'll see it in action. So the mold comes apart. That's a bubble of molten glass going in. Now the iron stick that you see in between my feet is a blowpipe. I'm blowing through that to inflate that bubble and it pushes the glass into that mold, forces it against the walls. And you can see there that it changed that shape from sort of a round bubble into that diamond faceted cup shape. Now, I just used a bunch of words uh, to describe the tools um, that I use every day, but I think it might be helpful if we define sort of some of those tools that glass blowers use. So the left slide is an aerial view of my tool deck. Um, and the first two tools to the right are jacks and tweezers. So that one of them actually looks like a large pair of tweezers and they're used for incising the glass and for pinching and pulling. So they're kind of like a substitute for your pointer finger and thumb. Uh, we of course can't touch the glass because it's around 2000 degrees. Um, that's the working window for our material. So you don't really wanna grab that. Now the next two tools to the, to the left of the tweezers are shears. So they look like scissors and that is basically what they do. So they're used to cut and uh, trim the glass um, just like you would use a pair of scissors on paper. The last tool on the tool deck is a metal paddle and that's used for flattening the glass. And it's also can be used to selectively cool the glass as we work with it. Now to the right, you can see um, sort of a zoomed out view of the same tool deck and working bench. So this is a, a pretty standard uh, workstation setup. And I wanna talk about the two metal pipes that you see across the rails of the workbench. So one of them I mentioned already, that's a blow pipe. It's a big metal straw. You blow through one end and air comes out the other end. Our glass at 2000 degrees is the consistency of honey. So if you imagine taking a straw and sort of winding up, uh, like sticking the straw into a, like a bowl of honey and winding that honey up onto the straw, that's essentially what we do all day in the glass blowing studio. Now the other metal, the other metal pipe that you see, it's a little smaller in diameter. That's um, called a punty or a gathering iron or just a bit rod. Um, we have lots of words for that. But what it means is that it's a solid piece of metal. So you can't blow through it, no air comes out of that pipe. And that's used for adding glass onto your bubble or a few other processes where you would need just a solid blob of glass. Oh yes, so I think it's important at this point to also note that in our presentation that Romans largely had the same selection of tools that Jesse has just described, almost to the T maybe with a couple of exceptions. 
There have been several uh, items found in archaeological excavations. Um, the pipe, for example, the blower's pipe that's hollow, there's been a, you know, a, a badly deteriorated iron glass blowing pipe uh, found in excavations. And even molds themselves have been found in excavations, though that is very rare to find them. Uh, in addition to those archaeological materials being found, there's also the telltale signs of how an object is made just by looking at it um, that tells us how they are made. And we'll go over some of those details in just a moment or two. So I mentioned that mold blowing is very quick and quote, easy, right? That Jessie was showing us earlier in her video clip. But just for some contrast, I wanted to show you a couple of items from the Getty Villos collection that it would have taken longer and the processes that would have predated um, mold blowing, whether or not these items themselves predate uh, mold blowing. So the item on the left is a perfume container and containers like these were made for about a thousand years, even before blowing even came about. And the best estimation from glass scholars is that an item like this, it takes about 45 minutes to make that vessel versus the 20 seconds, right, that you saw in the video clip. Now, the item on the right, you may have seen from the title, it is indeed a flask in the shape of a mouse, um, if it looks odd to you, with its upturned tail and stretched out ears and mouth and little added legs. Uh, these, you know, a vessel like this would probably take a little longer than a mold blown item. So the advent of mold blowing would really have uh, compacted or compounded uh, two processes, right? Making the shape of an item and its decoration. So that's another added benefit and innovation of mold blowing that Romans discovered. Yeah, I love this little mouse and that the, his feet on that um, mouse flask are really excellent example of um, like a creative use of adding hot bits to glass. Um, so what do I mean by that? This is a really excellent um, few images showing the process of adding glass to a pre-existing vessel. So if you look to the left, the left slide, you can see that there's a pitcher that is basically finished. It's sideways, we work this way. Um, so the pitcher shape is finished, but it still needs a handle to be added to it. So the brighter sort of orange glob that you see um, sort of aimed at the pitcher is another piece of glass. And it's actually the same color. It's sort of a light sort of bodily green, uh, but it's much brighter because the handle is much hotter. So the pitcher is what we call cold. It's probably around a thousand degrees and the handle is quite a bit hotter and glowing. And that means that the pitcher will stay sort of in its form while we swish the bit on and pull that bit of glass up. And you can see it's sort of stretched out in the right-hand slide. The next step after it's stretched out is to cut it using a pair of shears that we saw earlier. And then that handle actually gets sort of flipped over and touched back down towards the lip of the pitcher, making up, you know, a really familiar sort of handle shape. So nice setup to these objects that the crowd here already is aware of from early in the presentation. So whereas the bodies of these vessels were blown into a mold, the necks were stretched afterward and the handles added in just the same fashion that Jesse was just detailing for us. So you really can have a combination of several processes. All of this occurs hot, very hot. Um, so the hot head or the hot grapes would have a hot handle applied and some extra yeah. ripply decoration on the objects on the left. Exactly. All right, so um, a little bit about this cup from the beginning of the presentation. I wanted to show you its side to indicate the seam. Uh, Romans, very quickly after the advent of mold blowing, discovered that seams were becoming apparent, and they decided very craftily to hide them within the seam where the, gla you know, the glass would ooze out right between the um, mold elements and create a little line. Let's make it a palm frond or let's make it a Roman column, right? To hide it, something vertical or along the join of that seam. Some additional benefits um, of mold blowing that Romans enjoyed that you may have already guessed at throughout the presentation is the likelihood that you could mass produce items. 
And this is something that Romans did do. There are several examples of this cup alone in other museums around the world that have the same mold um, inscriptions, same palm fronds, same everything. So um, that's even evidence that's come down to us 2000 years later. Also, one byproduct of mass production is the affordability of those pieces. So these pieces could be afforded by anybody, um, you know, middle class um, citizens could be affording nice glass like this. And it's also a way to allow for a consistent measure. There's several examples, right? If you have a shop that's selling an ointment or something inside of a vessel, you could assure that the customer would always get the same amount. Yeah, so I love that glass cup. It's a really excellent example of hiding those seam marks. Um, and of course, in our contemporary version, uh, the seam marks are actually where the mold parts. So it's where the facets meet is where the seams are happening. So it, it's sort of hidden in uh, this contemporary example as well. So we talked about sort of hot finishing. We talked about adding handles to things. Um, but in my example, I actually crack the top off of my glasses to finish them. So we can actually start the video on the process for that. Um, here's the cup with the overblow. So the part that was still attached to the pipe, I'm gonna remove that using a process called cracking off. So in my hand, I have a glass cutter. It's a carbide wheel. And I'll use it to scratch the surface of the glass where I would like for it to break. I don't go all the way around the cup, just a little bit. Then it gets placed onto this Lazy Susan and I'll turn it. And in just a second, I'm going to apply a small handheld torch right at the area where I've scratched it. Now this torch is going to stress the glass and it's gonna cause that scratch that I made to break open and run hopefully around the lip of the cup. Now this can take anywhere from like 10 seconds to a minute for this crack to happen. So we've edited this down so you don't have to watch me spin this for a minute. So if you look to the right, you're gonna see that cup spinning and that crack happens really fast. So it's just popped apart. And now I'm gonna stop the spinning and I'll take the lip, that overblow off of the cup. And there's the almost finished object. So what I'll do in a contemporary setting is I'll maybe grind away the lip a little bit and I'll either use um, a process when it's cold to sort of finish that by hand grinding the material down or I'll apply a flame just to the lip to fire polish it. And that's where it's sort of that sharp edge where it's broken apart is um, heated and sort of rounds itself over. And so uh, I really, this is a really great example. Um, one of my favorites from the Getty collection. And if you look at the lip of this cup, the Janus head cup, you can see that that crack off is a little bit irregular. And if you're watching the last video closely, you might have noticed that my crack off also had a little bit of a, a hop in it where it didn't break exactly right. So um, that wouldn't pass quality control for me. I would go back and grind that little edge away, but I think for this cup, it must have it must have been all right. So it's a nice reminder that not everything is uh, exactly as you planned all the time. Right, and uh, because I know we'll get the question about how Romans did uh, you know, the finishing it would not be with a torch. Let me answer that right now. It would likely be with grinding away, just as uh, Jesse had mentioned as an alternative means today, grinding away, sanding away with something so that you wouldn't have a razor sharp cup meet your lips. I think we would be amiss in this presentation if we did not acknowledge artists, ancient artists, during this presentation, because here we have a co-host artist who's presenting with me today. So who exactly is making these objects in antiquity? Oddly enough, we don't know a lot about the artisans involved uh, with glassmaking other than their names. So here's a great example uh, from the Metropolitan Museum of Art where there's a cartouche or little inset part of the mold that actually preserves the name of the artist. And in Greek here, it says, Enion made it, or Enion made this, right? So you can see the implied in parentheses uh, words there because it just technically says Enion made, right? And there are several examples, well, many examples around the world and museum, museum collections around the world um, of Enion's work. 
but there are several others names who are preserved as part of the molds um, in museum collections as well. There's at least four or five names, though we don't know if Enion or these others were the factory owner. We don't know if they were the mold maker. We don't know if they were the blower or even all three or more, right? We don't know the significance without the, you know, um, textual evidence or otherwise. So um, it's, it's something that I hope that comes to fruition as the years pass and scholarship continues and archeology span continues. So an object like this would be um, maybe meant for wine, like an everyday use possibly. And I'll hand it off to Jesse to get into this luxurious item. Yes, uh, thanks for the handoff. Um, so, you know, all of the reasons that we've talked about Romans using mold blown glass are the same reasons that we still use mold blowing today. Um, and you can find examples of uh, mold blown glass in your own home. Um, and so this is an example of a pickle jar from my fridge that is was blown into a mold. It wasn't, um, it, was, it would have been blown by a machine, but the machine would have been inserting that glass bubble into a mold. And of course you can see to the right, there's that telltale seam line where that mold would have parted to allow the pickle jar to be removed and continue down the factory line. Um, so it's, it's there. I bet you could find some in your fridge. And from one end of the spectrum in today's times to high art, right? So we're going from pickle jars to high art. Molds are utilized in all manner of glass making today. And here we have a piece from the Corning Museum of Glasses collection, a design by Robert Rauschenberg, a famous artist that several of you are already are probably familiar with, but this time it's a glass tire. Yeah, I really love this um, object. Uh, and I think it's a really excellent example of um, contemporary mold blown glass. And so one of the things that I would like to highlight talking about this is the size. So this is a full size tire. It would be just the size of the tire that's on your car or your truck. Um, so it's quite a bit larger than our grape flask that we saw at the beginning. Uh, this also was blown into a mold. Um, and one of the other things I really like about this is that it's not immediately apparent how it was done. So what you need to do is imagine the tire on its side and the bubble and the blowpipe would have been inserted into the mold, kind of like the axle, like where the axle would go on your car. So the tire's on its side, the bubble goes in, and then the whole thing is cooled. Um, this is quite a large object. Um, and because of that, uh, the crack off process would not be the best or safest option to remove that overblow. So somebody would have gone in with a, a glass saw once the glass was cold and set, and they would have sort of cut away the overblow and also the bottom of the mold sort of where a hubcap would go on your wheel. So two sides of this have been cut away. And you can see on sort of the interior wall of the tire on that edge, it's a little bit um, more matte. And that's one of the, the signs that this was removed using a, a cold method, using a most likely a saw or some sort of grinding wheel. So I think I love this piece. Um, it's a really excellent uh, example of mold blowing in that it would also be like completely impossible to make this uh, without a mold. So, yeah. Thanks, Jesse. And I think we've successfully bridged that gap from ancient Rome to today. And uh, we are right on time to start with some Q and A. We have several questions that have been coming in. Thank you for those. You may continue to uh, enter those. We'll have a few minutes for that now. And as time allows, or as your time allows, you may continue um, and we can try to uh, address your questions. So let me take a look. I'll take the question here from Dennis about what materials Romans used for molds. And we know from archeological evidence that uh, stone molds were in use, ceramic molds were in use, and there is some justification for bronze possible as a mold um, based on other objects, uh, well, based on real metal objects that had evidence of <laughs> uh, a design and glass 
examples from elsewhere that have the exact same design. So it's likely that they came from a metal mold. So thank you, Dennis, for that question. Great, yeah, I can um, also, I'd be happy to answer the question about chemical pigment, pigments. Um, so glass colorants, um, it's a pretty exacting science, which um, I know very little about, but I can tell you that glass colorants are very similar to ceramic glaze formulas. So um, it's metals that make up the colors, different colors in glass. Um, and so uh, copper can make a blue or a red color. Um, nickel makes a gray, I believe. And uh, one of the favorite things that we tell people is that uh, gold makes pink glass. So of course, pink colored glass is the most expensive color to choose for your projects. Let's see, Lynn has a question about when and where glass blowing started or the first glass pieces found. So great question, uh, Lynn. Um, the most evidence is available for glass blowing, not mold blowing, but glass blowing, um, predating molds, uh, exists probably around the mid first century BC or so. And mold blowing comes within a century after that. So about mid first century AD is the best approximation from scholars. And uh, as to the examples, I think part of that question was, uh, what about the examples? In Jerusalem, there are um, several examples from uh, an archeological context dated to mid first century BC of sort of deflated wasters. Um, unsuccessful attempts of making um, blown items accompanied by thin tubing that had evidence of being stretched, uh, stretched from a gob of glass into a tube. This might be a little too complicated to try to explain without photos, but uh, that tube was then closed at one end with heat. And then there's evidence that by blowing through the cool end of the tube, you could inflate and heat the far end of the tube. So in Jerusalem around mid first century BC, there's evidence for that. Thank you for that question. Yeah, so I see a question here um, about the temperatures of the glass when the handle was attached to the pitcher in that bit example. Um, and so, yeah, it when we refer to cold glass in the glass blowing studio, uh, we're referring to things that are around a thousand degrees. Um, the glass can't get much colder than a thousand degrees um, without shattering. So once the piece is finished, we place it into an oven where it cools slowly over a, a, a minimum of 12 hours. Um, so yeah, so the picture in that example was not moving. It was not in a liquid state. The shape was set unless we reheated it. Uh, and only the handle was pliable at that point. But still, both objects of, of both pieces of that picture were, um, you know, above a thousand degrees. They were just a, a variance in temperature. We have a question here about seams and decoration types that are possible on mold blown items, and I can answer that. It seems that they do uh, all the designs sort of do fit nicely into many classifications. Um, for example, pagan religious scenes. Um, mythological creatures or gods. Um, there are also many vessels that have mercury, uh, the Roman god of commerce, um, on the base of the item. So sort of a, a nice tie-in of ancient culture that maybe we may or may not incorporate in our own work today. It was really neat to see commerce's god incorporated into items. Also things like the grapes flask we were looking at, like grapes and dates, like fun whimsical shapes are possible. All the heads are, you know, another category. There's many categories um, for decoration. And then of course the inscriptions about having fun and drinking. But I think my favorite are sport cups. So I think there was another question about that here. Uh, sport cups show various contests like gladiatorial bouts and so forth. Uh, there's some great cups and museum collections around the world showing gladiators fighting and even have their names preserved as part of the mold showing that they're real people with real names who were famous. 
I think that's just awesome. It's just the same as getting a commemorative cup for your favorite baseball player at a ball game today. And also there's a question here about why are the inscriptions that we've been talking about in Greek? What's the deal? Aren't these Roman pieces? Uh, well, it turns out, right? So Greeks were in control of a lot of, you know, the Mediterranean as well, predating maybe Roman Empire. And a lot of the Eastern part of the what became the Roman Empire still spoke Greek. And it was a very not elevated, like uh, an educated language, let's say. So oftentimes you do see the words in Greek. And that would be evidence that possibly that workshop came from the Eastern part of the empire. Um, I have I have a question here about uh, how do we determine the thickness of the glass um, made in the mold? Is it a matter of how hard and long you blow? Um, so I, I believe this is a question of like, how do you decide how much material goes into the mold? Um, and so glass is an additive process. So you would take the blowpipe and you would spool up um, some glass, as much glass as you could get, and then you would let that glass cool and you would apply another layer um, until you have the correct amount. Um, so you would most likely approach a new mold by practicing once or twice and sort of gauging how much glass you should take out of the furnace and then committing that amount to memory. Um, and then of course you would apply that sort of lens to the next shape. Oh, is this bigger or smaller than the last shape? I think that uh, this question, I think I can try to give the best education, educated uh, answer I can, can about the largest known glass objects from the ancient world. And I'll say that the largest ones that I'm aware of are probably about maybe a foot and a half tall um, that would be used as sort of as a transport item for large storage of amounts of, let's say, foods like oil or grain or wine. And Glass would have been a favorable material in which to store things like that because if you tried to store, let's say, oil in a ceramic container that's porous, it could become rancid. So glass itself is a very, um, oh geez, what's the word? Uh, it, it will not transfer taste. It will not transfer smell um, to your foodstuffs. So that's a you know a very advantageous large capacity. Um, storage material, though I have not seen a ton of those large objects. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Somebody's asking a question about how the multicolored perfume jar was made. And I believe they're referring to that uh, perfume container that I was referencing earlier that was white with some purple stripes. It's going to be a little difficult to describe here, but let me do you a favor and indicate to you that you should Google core forming. Core forming. It's a process in which predating blowing glass, you would essentially wrap glass around a removable core that could be scraped out later. And let's just say there's some um, animal waste involved in the process. So I won't go to get into it here because it isn't uh, directly related to mold blowing today. But let's just say it made a good porous material uh, to be removable from a hot item. Let's see. Oh, we have a really excellent question about Chihuly. And the mm. question is, how does Chihuly make such large pieces? Um, so I think one of the, like really um, lovely things about the Chihuly sort of sculptural work uh, is that it's many, most of those chandeliers are many small pieces that are assembled um, into a large sculpture. So uh, that's one way to go about it. Multiple pieces sort of push, push, push together so that they make one large piece. We have a um, question we probably should have incorporated into our presentation at all, which is, which is, what is glass even made from? What is it made from? So many of you may be aware, you know, people kind of say just sand, right? Sand, it can be superheated to be melted down to make glass, but it's silicon dioxide essentially with some additives that have other properties um, that are beneficial to melting glass. So 
you add a flux, something that lowers the melting temperature of that sand because sand has an insane, uh, or silicon dioxide has a very high melting temperature. So you add a flux to lower that. And then you add lime to that in order to make it non-water soluble. So essentially glass is three elements that are combined and melted. And then of course, all of the colorants that you may want that we were just talking about a moment or two ago. We had a couple questions here about ancient items that are found in very good condition. Why is that? How do they come down to us today? And I think there was even a great example in Denmark this week or last week, there was a great news item about a uh, ribbed bowl that was found nearly in perfect condition. So you may have seen a news item, all you glassophiles amongst the group here today. And oftentimes we have such greatly preserved glass because it comes down to us from perhaps tombs, things that have not been touched until archeologically excavated later. So that's why oftentimes you see um, them come down to us unbroken for an example, or um, in this example, I haven't looked into it yet, um, the recent excavation, but um, the ones that look so pristine, they would have likely had a very favorable environment available to them uh, that is not too humid, not too hot or cold. Um, as I alluded to previously with that iridescence discussion, uh, glass really likes a, a great relative humidity that is not going to make it flake through time. So likely in burial context, you have a controlled environment, <laughs> right? That is undisturbed um, and it comes down to us looking pretty great. And then of course, museums work with what they get and um, store objects in the best relative humidity and temperature conditions. But then I think the big question that many visitors have when they see a weathered item in a case is, can't you remove that? Can't you remove the weathering or scrape it off? And of course that would compromise the matrix of the glass. The glass itself would be deteriorated even further if you did something like that. So normally you would allow for that to remain intact on the object. Um, so I have a question here that is about um, what types of molds I use uh, in my practice and um, also noting that there was somebody helping me. Um, so it's sort of a, there's a two part answer. Um, glass blowers in contemporary times almost always work at least in pairs. Um, the process itself requires more than two hands. Um, there are a few glass blowers that work by themselves and they have um, they're really, there are some really excellent glass blowers that work by themselves, uh, but you have to kind of find workarounds. Um, so most of us work with a team member or, or more. Um, teams can get quite large depending on how big the sculpture is or how big the project is. And uh, so the hands that you saw open and close my mold are, um, would be my assistant's hands, whoever was helping me for that day. Uh, and the types of molds that are used in contemporary times uh, depend on sort of the project. So if it's an object that needs to be made a thousand times, then um, something a little sturdier is used, like either uh, graphite like you saw in the video, or you could use a metal mold with a, like a cork sort of uh, sheathing that the cork would burn away, but then you would just reapply it uh, to the metal so the metal stays intact. Um, indefinitely. If you need something up with a few less applications, wood is a really great uh, tool. So wood that's been soaked in water and um, you would, those are typically molds that you turn in um, as opposed to just blow into. So that your object would spin. Uh, so simple cylinders are made with wood molds. And then if you only need a few, uh, plaster of Paris is a really excellent material. Uh, it's very fast uh, to make a mold with plaster and you would use maybe a graphite or um, Coca-Cola sometimes. Uh, it's used as a release to allow the glass to get away, like break away from the plaster without harming the glass or the plaster. Uh, the thing about plaster and also about wood is that they're they're kind of consumables. So they they degrade much faster than metal or graphite would. And I think we're almost at the time we need to leave you all, but I think we have time for maybe one last question before we leave you today. And I think um, it's another one for Jessie. I think she might like to answer this one. 
are there kinds of ancient glass or specific glass objects that you find particularly fascinating? Where do you draw your influences from in creating new works? Oh gosh, well, I think that, um, you know, glass is such an like incredible material that there is an endless supply of inspiration. And uh, one of the reasons that we picked mold blowing was because it was uh, so interesting. Um, but there are some really excellent examples of, um, oh, I don't know, I, I really like trick goblets. Uh, so goblets that are meant to like, sort of like not work properly. Those are um, a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, I think, I think that might be my answer for right now, but it changes. It's always something different because there's always something new. Um, and then as far as my own work goes, um, I really uh, try and let the glass make some decisions for me. So um, glass is a really temperamental material to work with. And so in a lot of my color application, I'll try and just um, allow the color to sort of bleed where it wants to go and, and that sort of thing. Um, so that's something that I'm always looking to do, like make it make the glass work for me. That's a great way to end. I think that's a very organic uh, answer. Um, so I think at this point, we want to thank you, our audience, for being here today. We've really enjoyed talking with you. Jesse and I, um, and I want to thank Jesse specifically for uh, aiding us with this program today. I think the artist's voice is very important to incorporate. So thank you for joining us. Please check out more future programs at getty.edu and we'll see you next time. Thank you.